Hey brethren, um, today we're going to read in the Great Leaders of the Christian Church. Um, we're going to read about um, David Livingstone. He's a missionary to Africa. He lived from 1813 to 1873, so he lived about 60 years. There's a picture of him teaching the Bible to some Africans. And there's a picture of a journalist from England finding him after a long time. Because they were looking for him because they thought he was lost in Africa. Um, and here's a picture of his um, birthplace in Blontyre in Scotland. So I'll go ahead and get right into reading this book. David Livingstone, the Scottish missionary and explorer, exercised a greater influence on the history of Central Africa than any other person, Christian or non-Christian, in the 19th century. As, evangel as an evangelist or church planter, his achievements were minimal. As a crusader against the cruelties of the East African slave trade, his success was limited. Yet, as an explorer, his record is unparalleled. Some would therefore dispute his right to the title missionary, and Livingstone's missionary service in the employ of the London Missionary Society was indeed restricted to the years of 1841 to 1856. However, Livingstone himself regarded all his activities, geographical exploration included, as a part of his missionary commission. He believed they were a part of the purpose of God to, quote, open up, end quote, the African interior to the gospel and its intendant's blessing of freedom and prosperity. Livingstone's travelings did, in fact, open up large areas of Central Africa both to later missionary work and to European commercial and imperial penetration. The beginnings of Protestant missions in what are now Malawi, Uganda, and Tanzania, and Zaire, were all, to a greater or lesser extent, a consequence of the impact made by his life and death. It may be appear iron ironical that the man whose selfless, whose selfless devotion to the welfare of African people has become legendary should also be remembered by some modern writers as a pioneer of the age of European colonial rule in Africa. His life and work remain the subject of argument and conflicting interpretations, but no modern reassessment has dislodged his position as the most remarkable Christians of the 19th century. David Livingstone, um, Explorer and Missionary, written by Brian Stanley, Medical Student. David Livingstone was born in 1830, 1813 into a, the harsh environment of the British Industrial Revolution. The one-room home in which he grew up in Blontyre, Scotland, overlooked the cotton mill where, from the age of 10, he, he worked as Fourteen hours, a fourteen-hour day. His early education consisted of night school, supplemented by reading books supported on the spinning frame at which he worked. His appetite for hard work and thirst for knowledge were reinforced from the age of twenty by a strong personal Christian faith. After reading an appeal for medical missionaries for China by the German missionary Karl Gutzlaff. Livingstone determined to train as a doctor for missionary service. Medical and theological, theological studies in Glasgow led to his acceptance in 1838 by the London Missionary Society, LMS, for further training. China proved imp an impossible destination owing to the outbreak of the First Opium War in contact with Robert Moffat, who lived from 1795 to 1883, the celebrated LMS missionary in southern and south africa and livingstone's future father-in-law um induced the young scot to volunteer for service in southern africa livingstone became began his missionary career on moffat's stations at kuruman in july um 1841 but soon moved farther into the interior in search of peoples unreached by the missionary influence from 1843 to 1853 he worked among the Tswana people, but with only a single conversion, that of the Bakwena chief, Sakele, to show for his labors. 
Increasingly, Livingstone's aspirations focused on the territory farther to the north on either side of the Zamb Zambezi River. Here, the country was more populous and out of reach of the Boer farms from the south. All Above all, the Zambezi um, offered the prospect of a route for legitimate trade, which Livingstone believed to be the only force capable of dr driving the slave trade from the region. He decided first to push northwestward to the Atlantic coast in hope of finding an alternate route to Central Africa. But that, um, um, that would avoid, um, hostile Boyer territory. Um, after a journey of astounding courage, Livingstone reached the coast of Luanda in May of 1854. Disappointed with the west coast route, he then proceeded not merely to retrace his steps, but to follow the course of the Zambezi to its mouth on the Indian Ocean, where he revived, um, arrived in May 1856, after a journey of nearly 2,500 miles. National Hero Livingstone returned to Britain in December of 1856 to find himself feted as a national hero. His geographical achievement was unprecedented, and it had been accomplished in the name of a cause dear to the heart of the evangelical conscience in Britain, the elimination of the hated slave trade from the African continent. However, the public applause concealed serious divergences of, of view between Livingstone and the LMS, which had surfaced long before his return. Livingstone spoke of going back to Africa, quote, to try to make an open path for the commerce for commerce and Christianity, end quote. Knowing that the LMS would not give him a free hand to engage in exploration and trade, Livingstone had allowed negotiations to proceed with the British government regarding an appointment as British con as a British consul. In October 1857, he informed the LMS that his return to Africa would not be under its auspices, and in March, the, the Zambezi expedition sailed under Livingstone's leadership. Um, the expedi expedition was a disaster. On his trans-African journey, Livingstone had jumped to the, the erroneous conclusion that Zambezi would be nav navigable virtually in its entirety. He had gravely underestimated the Cabora Basa Rapids. Their impassibility to the streamer traffic destroyed Livingstone's vision of the Zambezi as a highway for Christianity and commerce into the heart of Africa. He turned instead to the Shire River, which stretched northward from the Zambezi into Lake Malawi, which he discovered in it at its end. The land at the southern end of the lake appeared well populated and favorable to cotton cultivation. A Christian commercial presence there might cut off a large proportion of the East African slave trade at its source. Before this vision could find any fulfillment, the British government recalled the expedition in 1863. So ended one of the saddest episodes in Livingstone's life, marked by constant wrangling between Livingstone and his companions by the crowning blow of the death of his wife, Mary, in April 1863. Livingstone's reception in Britain on his second visit home in 1864 through 1865 was notably cooler than in 1856 to 1858. The British, the British government had lost its former enthusiasm for its plans, for his plans. He returned to Africa for the last time in 1866 as an unpaid consul with merely nominal authority. His final years were spent exploring the uncharted territory between the between Lakes Malawi and um, Tanganyika, Tanganyika. For years at a time, his whereabouts were very and very survival were unknown to the rest of the world. Expeditions were dispatched to find Livingstone. This, the one led by the journalist H. M. Stanley, was merely the best publicized and most successful. Stanley's discovery of Livingstone in November 1871, followed in January 1874 by the poignant news of his death at Chit Chitambo at May, 1, May 1, 1873, ensured that Livingstone was once again a legend, 
a heroic symbol of the driving sense of mission that lay at the heart of Victorian Christianity. Puncturing the Myth Recent biographies of Livingstone have taken some pleasure in puncturing the, quote, Livingstone myth and exposing some of the less attractive personality traits revealed in his journals and correspondence. As missionary, he found the yoke of society control almost unbearable. The LMS had cause, certainly had cause to complain in 1857 about the way Livingstone kept the society in the dark about his negotiations with the British government at a time when the society was counting on his continued services. As a husband and father, Livingstone must bear some of the responsibility for the sadness that afflicted the members of his family. His wife, Mary, strained by years of separation from her husband and inadequate financial support, became prey to bouts of depression and drinking. As a leader of men, Livingstone was often dictatorial and unreasonable. But his failings were, um, were the obverses, were the obverse of his strengths, the product of, of, of his obsession with the service of Africa in the name of Christ. Any assessment of David Livingstone's significance in Christian history ought to focus not on the rough edges of his personality, but on the issues that his missionary theory and practice raised for later generations. Some of Livingstone's ideas seem dated and eccentric. His hope of eliminating the slave trade by the introduction of legitimate commerce in African raw materials and European manufacturers reflected the intellectual influences of this youth and in the particular um, the ideas of the Scottish economic philosopher Adam Smith. The attempts of Livingstone and his immediate successors to ally missionary work in Central Africa with European trade were counterproductive. After his death, confidence in the early Victorian missionary prescription of, quote, commerce and Christianity gradually evaporated. Livingstone believed that God was at work in every area of human activity, in geographical discovery or commercial intercourse, as, well, as much as in the strictly Christian sphere, moving history to a, quote, glorious consummation when the rule of Christ would be supreme. His was a Christian vision typical of the Victorians in its rational optimism. Nonetheless, the breadth of his missionary understanding remain, reminds the church in a less confident age that conversion to Christ in, does indeed have implications for the economic and cultural life of a society. Missionary Expansion Of more immediate relevance today is Livingstone's unchanging insistence that the watchword and missionary strategy ought not to be consolidated, but expand, but expansion. I mean, it ought his missionary strategy ought not to be consolidation, but expansion. He criticized the LMS for co concentrating its missionary res resources in the well-established churches of the Cape Colony, while ignoring the mass of unevangelized peoples to the north. He warned that the prevailing policy of consolidation was producing missionary-dominated ch churches. Quote, Perpetual tutelage and everlasting leading strings would enfeeble angels. End quote. The rates of growth in, of the African churches were, he argued, in inverse in proportion to the number of missionaries stationed among them. In some respects, indeed, Livingstone anticipated modern church growth theory. He justified his own policy of publishing ever onward beyond the Tswana people to evangelize the surrounding tribes as, quote, the only way which permits the rational hope that when the people do turn to the Lord, it will be by groups, end quote. Recognizing that the level of receptivity to Christianity among the most African peoples at the time was extremely low, he urged that missions should not concentrate should concentrate not on obtaining isolated conversion within a well-worked, limited area, but rather on the widest possible diffusion of Christian truth and principles, so that the condition might be created for whole peoples to turn to Christ. According to David Livingstone, there could be no substantial missionary reaping without a prior commitment to widespread sowing, and his own career was wholly cr consistent with this maxim. The Protestant churches of the sub of Sub-Saharan Africa
many of them born in, after, in the aftermath of Livingstone's exploration, are today among the strongest in the world. Livingstone believed himself to have been led by God to, quote, open up Africa for the gospel. More than a century after his death, it seems that he may, after all, have been right. And that's the end of this section on David Livingstone, the missionary to Africa from Scotland. But God bless. In Jesus' name, amen.